Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, April 29th, we are studying Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. The word of God preached by Peter on Pentecost cuts his hearers to the heart. What is next? Repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins, as the Lord adds to his church. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us Pastor Isaac Schuler. Pastor Schuler serves at First Emmanuel Lutheran Church in San Jose, California. Pastor Schuler, welcome to Sharper Iron. Hey, thank you, Pastor Apple. Pleasure to be here. Hey, glad to have you. Pastor Schuler, you were telling me that your congregation worships in both English and Spanish, and that you have your congregation has a Spanish name, and I don't want to try to say it on air, but I know you can. So, so <laughs> tell me a little bit about, your, you've got a, both an English and a Spanish congregation there? So, what, long story short, uh, we say that we have one congregation, but we have uh, two services. So yes, we have a, an English service and a Spanish service, and the, the Spanish service, uh, the name is just the First Emmanuel translated into Spanish, so Primera Emmanuel. And it's just been, it's been a, an honor um, to be able to serve in both languages and kind of get a, a glimpse of the picture we get in Revelation where people from every tribe, every language, and every nation are before the Lamb of God. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and, a, and a picture of the day of Pentecost. We're, we're talking about the, exactly. the end of Pentecost here, and, and that's how the whole thing got started, where the d- disciples started speaking in these languages. So with that, talk about context, Pastor Schuler. What do we need to know leading up to our text for today? You know, that's, that's a great thing. I didn't pick up on that. Thank you for, for mentioning that. So in the context of, of Acts 2 here, we know that they're, they're gathered for Pentecost. You have Jews from, from all over the place um, to celebrate this feast. And so they're there, and you know we, we hear in the Bible that they just heard uh, the speaking in different languages, in, in tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And they're thinking that these, these people are drunk. Uh, many are thinking that they're drunk, uh, but Peter stands up and, and gives this this wonderful sermon. Um, I would definitely of law and gospel, uh, and as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, they were they were cut to the heart. Right. So we get the the aftermath of Pentecost or the response. We kind of left it hanging in in yesterday's show. The last thing that that Peter said was this Jesus whom you crucified. You know, reminding them that hey. He was crucified because of you. You were the ones that handed him over to Pontius Pilate to be crucified. And now here comes their response. And so we're going to just jump right into this text. We're picking up in Acts 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about three thousand souls." I think I'll pause there. That takes us through verse 41 of the text. So the reaction was they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the apostles, what do we do? What uh, Explain this reaction of the people to us, Pastor Schuler. Sure. Now, when we hear that they're cut to the heart, I, th- I think many times when we use the law, you know, you crucified Christ, um, Peter or people respond in two ways. One way, thinking, yeah, I, I'm a sinner. Wow, this is this cuts me to the heart. Or uh, we hear this later on in Acts. I don't remember exactly where it was, but the people want to um, kill uh, the person who is preaching uh, because the law did not necessarily cut them, um, but they they instead are infuriated because we know that the, the law convicts, the law the law kills. 
And so they're, they're basically saying, okay, what, so you've shown us, yes, we're the ones that crucified Jesus, so, so now, now what should we do? So, and so the matter of being cut to the heart, this is, the, this is what should happen when the law is preached. And, and that's really only something that the law itself can do, right? I mean, it's not something that is, Peter, I think we can say, is a masterful preacher. He shows that in Acts chapter 2. He'll show that in the sermon he's going to preach in Acts chapter 3. But it's not so much the mastery of the preacher as it is the word of the Lord that does this cutting. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's the beauty of, of being a Lutheran, is that simply proclaiming the Word of God and its truth and its purity, and, and just stepping back and watching um, what God will do, right? We don't, we don't have to uh, force this person to a, a decision or uh, twist this person's arm and try to reason them into faith, but it is, it is the Word of God that cuts the heart. It is the Word of God that, that places heart or places through the gospel faith into the person's heart. That, I think that's going to be one of the, the emphases of our text in particular, and certainly throughout the book of Acts, that it is the word of the Lord that does this work. You know, this book is titled fully The Acts of the Apostles, and yet as we introduced the book a couple of days ago, you know, this is what the word of the Lord is doing through the apostles. This is Jesus still at work in his word, and we're seeing it here as he cuts people to the heart through his word. And, you know, it's, like you said, it's great to be a Lutheran. There's no altar call at the end of Peter's sermon. He just puts it out there. This is what's happened. This is what you've done. They're the ones, because of the, the word of God working on them, they, they respond, right? They respond to the word of God. The word of God is active in their lives. They ask the question. I want to talk a little bit about the question because, and maybe the reason I'm, I'm asking this is because of that rich young ruler in the Gospels, you know, he comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to be saved? Here the question is, what do, what do, I need, what do we need to do? But it, it sounds like this is a different question than what the rich young rulers asked. What, what is behind their question? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, with, with the rich young ruler, right, he, uh, he thinks that he can fulfill the law. Right, yes, I've done this, I've done this, check this, check this. So, so in the end, Jesus knows his heart. He knows... Um, what thing he cannot do to fulfill the law, which is sell everything he has and, and give to the poor. And so he is, he goes away sad. Um, yet with these people, um, they hear the gospel proclaimed as well as the law, and they're, they're cut to the heart. And they're, in a sense, we, I guess we could say that they are, they are sincere. They're not coming up and saying, hey, we've tried to fulfill these laws, um, but they're coming and saying, what, what, what are we supposed to do? We're, you're right, we're the ones that, that have killed Christ. Hmm. Right, so it's not a, what, what are we supposed to do in the sense of they think they can earn salvation, but it's almost like a, now what? Okay, you're, you're right, Peter, we did this. We crucified the Lord of glory. What, what comes next? And, and Peter's answer... Right is so wonderful. And again, it's not a it's not an altar call. It's not it's not a make a decision, say this prayer, but it is I mean, what a beautiful answer. And I, as I was preparing for our conversation, Pastor Schuler, every phrase is is so rich. So he says, he says to them, first repent. So let's start there. Repent. What does that mean? Right. So um, to to turn around, right? To what is it metanoia? Uh, and I think that this part of chapter 2 verse 38 when, when we talk and we'll be talking soon about baptism um, the rebuttal that is brought up by some and why we shouldn't baptize our children mm. is because they can't repent right mm. yes um, but sad, sadly sadly uh, that that ultimately concludes that our children can't have faith mm. and because in the end we know that that repentance is is a work of God mm. that it comes by, by the Holy Spirit, that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and we would say, too, that, that repentance, when we repent, it, it is a sign of faith, too. That, you know, I, I find this very, very, very comforting for the people that say, you know, I struggle. Um, I have difficulty. Well, do you continue to trust in the Lord and know that, uh, that he forgives you of your sins? A absolutely. Well, I hate to break it to you, but you know you still you still have faith. You you still the Lord still cares for you, and and repentance is is just as you were stating earlier. It's it's going to come back to God. Mm. It is a work of God within us. Mm. 
when when I think about this word repentance, uh, I guess we'll, I'll start. Uh, there's a couple things that come to mind. We'll start with the the scriptures. It you know the the picture, particularly from the pen of Luke, since we're dealing with him as author still. When I think of repentance, I think the best picture in Luke comes from chapter 15 of his gospel, where you get those three parables from Jesus about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons. And I, you know, you can debate the titles, but but in each case, you see this picture of, as Jesus says, a sinner who repents, and how much joy there is. Well, wh- how is that repentance accomplished in all of those parables? It's always by the the one who stands for God or the Lord doing the finding, you know, the, the shepherd who goes to find the lost sheep, the woman who goes to find the lost coin, the father who's going out to find his lost sons. That's the picture of repentance. And as you said, this is God's work in us, not something that, that we do. It is him accomplishing that. And there is great comfort in that. So that, yeah, I think Luke 15 is a fantastic picture of repentance and ought to fill, you know, what Peter has when we, when he says the word repent, we need to have that picture in our minds. Yeah, that, that is a, you know, it's great to, to bring it back to Scripture, interpret Scripture, and especially making note, kind of going off of that a little bit more, uh, with the lost sheep, um, the implication is that, right, it's still a sheep of the shepherd, that the shepherd is actively seeking after the sheep, that the lost coin, the prodigal son, they, they still belong to, to the master, to, to the Lord, and the Lord is faithful, even when we are faithless. Yeah, I mean that, that and that's a great a great point to make, particularly for these people who crucified Jesus. And uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday in, in the context of Peter's sermon. Peter quoted from Joel chapter two and said, "You know, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." With the indictment that's made against these people, you crucified Jesus. There's kind of that question hanging. Well, can I be saved if I call upon the name of the Lord, even? I who crucified the Lord of glory. And, and that's where, you know, the beautiful picture that you've said, this is still, you're still a sheep. You're still the son. And that's what the father wants is to, to bring his sheep, his sons home. That's what he's doing for these people. So repent. And then the other thing that, that comes to my mind when I hear the word repent, to, to speak now of the confessions, and you brought this up with when it comes to the conversation we're going to have about baptism and the role of faith. You know, in the Confessions, we very clearly say in, in Article 12 of the Augsburg Confession that the two parts of repentance are contrition, the, the terror striking the conscience, and then faith, which comes from the gospel. And so this repentance is very much a matter of faith. It's not just the sheer terror, which we certainly know they feel, but it is that faith, and that's what Peter is calling for here. Yeah, ab- absolutely. It is... Uh can't say it any more clearly, a, a wonderful thing that, that God works within us and, and, and does for us, and, and we rejoice in it. That's right. That's right. So Peter starts with there, repent, and then be baptized every one of you. So that, let's, let's just take it one phrase at a time. Be baptized every one of you. Help us into Peter's answer as he continues. Yes. yes. Uh, again, beautiful, beautiful gospel, right? It's, it's such a joy to be a Lutheran. And when we hear this, this right here, I, I try to, people that are opposed to, you know, our children having faith, our children repenting, I just simply state, if you were there at that Pentecost when Peter is preaching this sermon, and it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, are you then going to look at your child and say, well, he's not talking to you. He does not mean this for you. Um, you know, I can get in tons of soap boxes about this, but um, <laughs> one, 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 one quick tangent here. Uh, with people that don't want to baptize their children, and, you know, I love them. I got people in my family. Um, I just ask them, why do you bring them to church? Mm. You know, if they, can't, if they can't believe, if they can't repent, just, just leave them at home. You know, why change their diaper? They can't tell you they want to change it. They can't ac- accept your offer of, of changing this. Or I mean, they can't accept the offer, but they, uh, it's because it's a gift from God, right? You're called to, to care uh, for your children, which I'm kind of getting ahead of the text here. I might be talking a little bit too fast, too. But no, that's so okay. Down. No, you're fine. Get, I get excited here. But so, so be baptized, every one of you. So he, he's saying that this gift of baptism is, is for you, right? Because they have been cut to the heart. So he's saying, here it is. Here's this gift of God. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I know that this this takes us to Matthew's gospel, but this again is what Jesus had given his disciples to do 
before his ascension. In in Matthew at the very end, you know, it's it's go to all nations and do two things, baptize and teach. And Peter's done the teaching, and now he says it's time for the baptizing, right? This is what what brings you into the family of God, to use that language from Matthew. This is what makes you a disciple of Jesus, God's gift to you. And you know, there is there there are so many, I suppose, soapboxes that we could get on, but this is really a key verse when it comes to holy baptism. You know, I mean, we've got the Lord's institution there in Matthew 28, and here is the first instance within the, the early church that's recorded for us of that being put into practice. And so, it, I mean, it, it's marvelous. And again, we shouldn't be surprised, but it is marvelous to see how those two things line up. You know, who was to be baptized in Matthew 28? All nations. Who's to be baptized here? In Peter's own words, every one of you. And, and as you said, that certainly does not exclude the children of the people who are gathered together on this day. Right. Absolutely. Every one of you, all nations. Yeah. That, that this is a wonderful gift for you. Yeah. So so this is to be done then, to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now this is maybe, there's maybe some confusion here. What does that mean, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Matthew 28 was in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. How do these things go together? Sure, absolutely. So we, w- we would basically say that that when Jesus states in Matthew 28, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that here in the name of Jesus, we would not state that it's, it's anything different, that we would not state that all of a sudden they are starting to um, reject the, the triune name um, in baptism, but we would state that they are still baptizing um, within the triune name, because when you baptize in the triune name, you are baptizing in the name of Jesus. Because uh, as we see as the Trinity works, the Father sends the Son, um, and the Spirit testifies to who the Son is. And so when we say we baptize in the name of Jesus, I would say that it's no distinction um, than that we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because that is how, how the Trinity works. Hmm. So this is not, and, and this is, uh, the reason I bring this up is because this comes up later in the book of Acts, where it talks about being baptized in the name of Jesus. The words in Acts are not meant to give us the, uh, if I can use this language, the formula for baptism. That is the words that the pastor or any Christian would say at a baptism. That's what we have in Matthew 28. This is just another way of speaking about that same formula that was given there in Matthew 28. Yeah, sure, absolutely. It's like, I mean, I just thought of the, the example right now, um, but I, you know, I, I'm married, I have three kids. And, and they have their names, right? Um, but we have this, uh, we, we would state that this is my, my family unit. And so this, this, we, would, we do things in, in the name of our family, but in the end we know, we know what our specific names are, and, and we still keep those. Um, I don't know if it's a very clear example. Um, I, I think so. So that, you know, you could say in the name of our family, or you could say in the name of the, the individual children, that doesn't change what the, the again, the formula is. So, and I think part of it is Correct. just the way we, we speak in English maybe isn't as clear. When we say in the name of Jesus, we hear that as in the name, comma, Jesus, rather than something like in the name that belongs to Jesus, or the name that is in which Jesus is included, perhaps. Maybe that's the way that we can understand this. So what is the name in which Jesus is included? The triune name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for... uh clarifying my, my example there. Appreciate sure, it. sure. Our iron sharpens iron. That's that's what we're doing here this morning, Pastor go. Schuler. That's right. <laughs> so, so okay, so again, and, and this is, you know, for the, we, just to, because this came up in the news not that long ago. I believe it was a, it was a Catholic priest who, who made the news because he had done some baptisms with a slightly altered formula. I think he had said, we baptize rather than I baptize. When it comes to the institution of of the Lord's gifts, we should make use of the words that he has given and not change them so that we don't lose the certainty of what the gift is. Yes, absolutely. Hey, your safest bet is always to to be as biblical as possible, and especially the, the words have meaning, right? The Holy mm-hmm. Spirit um, inspired the writers to write these words, um, and that, that we should be diligent and be, be faithful 
um, to what has passed has been passed down to us. That way, like you said, that conscience are are put at ease. That there is not not doubt um, over certain things. And I think too, it goes into uh, into church practice. You know, across across the world, that we would want to be united. I mean, that's that's the purpose of a synod, right? So that we could walk together. Mm. Right, and and that's what we're going to see the church doing as as the text will continue. They are united around the Lord's word, and so the same is true for us. That is what does call us together as the church. That's what continues to unite us, and so for us to be united, that is the gift of the Lord. Now, again, so Peter's words, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Here, Here's what, that's the gift, the forgiveness of sins. Take us, Take us farther. Yes, so baptism actually does something, right? That's it's right. not just a, not just a symbol, uh, and, and thanks be to God for that, right? This is why, um, you know, when we uh, start our divine service in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we are welcomed to make the sign of the cross in remembrance of our baptism. Um, and, and in fact, we we do this. There's many times, right, throughout the service, you have the, the invocation, um, the absolution, and then you have the creed, and, and I as a um, part Peruvian, I actually make the sign of the cross um, in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from mm-hmm. evil, and then at the benediction. And, and yet all of these points, uh, you can see that there is um, a connection to our baptism, right? We are baptized into the triune name. Um, because we are baptized, we are forgiven of our sins. Um, because we are baptized, we receive eternal life. Uh, um, because we are baptized, you know, we receive Christ's body and blood. Uh, because we are baptized, we are delivered from evil. And then closing with a benediction because we are baptized um, into the triune name um, again. And so we have the forgiveness of sins. God delivers the goods, right, through baptism, especially in this, in this context. And I, I think this is an important point to make because as Lutherans, we would state our comfort, our assurance is found right, in Christ, yet Christ delivers um, these means or these goods through the means, especially in this context, of baptism. I think that's the the misunderstanding many times for people is they'll say, well, it's not baptism that saves, but it's Christ that saves. Well, how do you receive Christ? And and one of those ways in this text here is baptism. And this for this reason, you receive the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is I know that in the in the catechism in the second part where Luther talks about the benefits of baptism. He uses the text from Mark 16, but this text serves the same purpose. You know, what does baptism do? It works forgiveness of sins. Here, Peter very clearly testifies to that. And this is, this is really an important point that, you know, baptism, when we bring our infants to be baptized, it certainly is, is an adorable moment. The, the children are cute and whatever they're wearing, no doubt. But it's, it's, not, it's not a cute photo moment. It, this is the Lord actually doing his work for that child or however old the person may be at the moment that's the lord actually doing his thing for them and that's where you know i mean the passive nature of this text you know on the one hand they've asked what do we do but the things that peter gives them to do are all passive repent that's god's gift be baptized well i mean that is a passive form who's doing the baptizing god is and what's he doing he's forgiving sins at that very moment yes and absolutely. And, you know, in, in Luther's right, of the baptism, right? Depart unclean spirit, mm. make room for the Holy Spirit. Um, mm. Make room for the spirit that will, will be cleansed, um, that will be regenerated, that will be forgiven. Mm. Um, and all of this is, is thanks be to God. And you, you make a good point there that, um, you know, I tell the people, it's, it's not me who's doing the baptism, but it is, it is God. You know, I, I am simply here in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, and he is, he is working through me to do this. So when you have doubts of your faith, you go back to this concrete thing that has happened to you, that God has baptized you. And, you know, we say remember your baptism. I remember somebody saying, well, how can I remember my baptism? Or my kids remember their baptism. They were infants. And in the end, we state that, that faith does recall the promises of God. And in the end, even if you forget, the Lord is faithful to his promises. He does not forget the covenant that he has, the pact, the promise that he has made um, with you in your baptism. Mm. Now, you brought up Luther's baptismal rite, which speaks about the departing of the 
unclean spirit, the evil spirit. And then Peter, he brings that really to mind as he says, so you're baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Take us into that part of Peter's answer. Yes. This is a this is a marvelous place. Thank you for allowing me to do such a wonderful um, text. As this. I mean, all of Scripture is wonderful, make no mistake of that. I think as Lutherans, we, we definitely... Um, like this section very much because it speaks so clearly and truly as to what we believe about faith and baptism and, and God's work towards us. And this is actually a, the formula that I use when children come forward who have not received, uh, have not been catechized to receive communion or adults that haven't been catechized. Uh, they cross their arms and I, I state, remember your baptism and your baptism, your sins are forgiven and you receive the Holy Spirit. So in our baptism, um, God takes this unclean spirit, this, uh, this uh, anti-Christ spirit that we are born with, right? And we are born into sin. And he puts his Holy Spirit, um, a, a clean spirit, a spirit uh, that will want to rejoice um, in, in the Word of God. And, and so it, it completely uh, transforms us and it allows us to have ears that are open to receive the Word of God. Uh, one thing that I actually like to do after a baptism, especially uh, after an infant being baptized, that there's a portion in the sermon where I will look specifically at the infant and just preach to the infant. Mm-hmm. And to the world, this seems like madness, right? The child has, they think the child has no idea um, what we are saying, but they have the Holy Spirit. They, they understand um, the mysteries of, of God. They, they have faith. Mm-hmm. It really is a marvelous part of the baptismal liturgy where you, you do address the one baptized, whether infant or adult, you baptize them in the same way, you know, receive this burning candle. You, you've received the light of Christ and you are, you're talking to the one who is baptized, no matter how old they are, because they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so they have received the gift of faith. And we're going to pick up more of this marvelous text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking Acts chapter 2. With Pastor Isaac Schuler, we'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, April 29th. We're studying Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47 with Pastor Isaac Schuler. He serves at First Emmanuel Lutheran Church in San Jose, California. Pastor Schuler, prior to the break, we were talking about the last part of Peter's first sentence, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is a significant verse also for those who would deny that the Holy Spirit is actually given in baptism or those who would say to look for a a second baptism of the Holy Spirit that's somehow separate from the the so-called water baptism. That's the way they would speak. Here, Peter very clearly puts them together, that when you receive the water baptism, the water and word, you also receive the Holy Spirit. It's a key verse for that as well. Yes, absolutely. I thank you for, for bringing that up. Because again, Baptism actually does something. So if, if one were to deny this and say that, oh no, baptism doesn't give, give the gift of the Holy Spirit, then what in the world does this text mean? Does it, I, I, mean, I, I have no answer to that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, so baptism actually does something. It forgives sins. Uh, it, it gives the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, um, in Ephesians, right, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, yeah. or one Lord, one baptism, one faith. Uh, I'm not remembering the order right now, but we, we have confessed this, you know, from the beginning. Uh, I mean, we stated in the creed, right? One baptism for the forgiveness, for the remission of sin. And so to say that there are these multiple baptisms, um, in a sense, is, is very confusing. And, and not only that, but it's, it's, a, it's a scorn and despising of the, as they would call, water baptism, right? Mm. They would state, well, it's not really, I mean, Let's, let's be honest, right? The, the, this 
water being poured on me doesn't mean anything. I just do it because God tells me to do it, which my response is, when in the world does God tell us to do something just for the sake of doing something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when we have, and then continue with that, they will say that I really know, I know it's my spiritual baptism that, um, that, that gives me um, faith and life and so on. But yes, here Peter is combining the two, and we know that there is one baptism according to Ephesians, and also later on in Acts, right, they I don't want to get too much into this because you're going to cover it later, uh, but those who are baptized by John come and, and they say, you know, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit, and so they receive the baptism of Christ. Uh, and just real quick to that, I just simply state, no one's baptized into the baptism of John nowadays. Hmm. Everyone is baptized into the baptism of Christ. And John himself says, I must decrease so that he must increase. Mm-hmm. So baptism is, is a beautiful thing. Hold on to it. It gives you forgiveness of sins. It gives you the Holy Spirit. Um, and you, you just need it one time. That's you know, right. for those of us who have been baptized um, one, two times, three times, 40 times, whatever it might be, um, the first one um, is what counts. And, and God, God remembers um, his promises. Just like I don't have to marry my wife um, multiple times when I right. when I sin against her, I just simply repent, uh, and and she forgives me, and uh, you know our, our marriage continues stronger. And... Yeah, that that that's a that's a good example. I, I like to think of those those second or third or fourth or however many baptisms. Those are when when the Lord gives us the gift of His Word and we see clearly what He teaches about baptism. That that those we. Sh- if if that is is you, then think of those as very vivid remembrances of the one baptism that the Lord gave you in the first place. Uh, that that's the way that I I like to think of those. When when those who who have been you know have that done multiple times, that's the way I encourage them to think about them. You were baptized once. God kept His promise. He didn't forget it, and you had these very vivid remembrances of those of that baptism. So yeah, if you if you are baptized, and that's that's the other way. I, I was taught to speak this way. Yeah, certainly we can say I was baptized on whatever date, but to, to really think of it, I am baptized. You are baptized. Yeah, this is an ongoing thing that doesn't go away. So do you need to be baptized again? No, by no means. God remembers his promise, and that his promise, he's keeping it for you right now. You are baptized. Absolutely. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I've, I've made that point um, for a, a couple of years here, and, it, and I usually make it in, in parallel, too, with marriage. I don't. I don't tell my wife. Well, I was married to you, right? Um, but I, t- I tell her, right? I, I am married to you, and I give thanks to God for that. Just as I give thanks to God that that I am baptized. Yeah, yeah. So in that baptism, the one baptism that you've received, you've got the forgiveness of sins. You've got the Holy Spirit. And as as Peter continues, again, I just, I mean, what a what a wonderful text about baptism. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And I mean, just to, and I'll, please comment on this, Pastor Schuler, but just to reiterate, you know, again, this promise is for all nations and it's the Lord's doing. It's for those the Lord is calling. He's making the promise, he's doing the work, and it's happening for everyone right here and now in baptism. Absolutely. And again, going back to a point that I made earlier, that if you are the first hearers of this sermon, uh, and then after you cut to the heart, and what well, must, uh, how do they say it exactly? Uh, brothers, what shall we do? And then repent and be baptized. This promise is for you and your children. You know, whether the, the children were there or not, um, when you hear this first time, are you really going to think, he just said it's for me and my children. But it's not really for my young children. It's only for my adult children. Right. I mean, that, that would be, that'd be ridiculous. Right. Uh, and, and, and two, you know, when it comes back to as the head of the household should teach his family in a simple way, you want to give God's gifts to your family. And if a good father wants to give these good gifts to his family, how much more does our Heavenly Father want to give good gifts to us, his children? Mm. And so... Here, Peter is saying, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, those who are not here um, today. And, you know, maybe uh, extrapolating a little bit, but those in the future, um, they will receive this promise too through their baptism. Um, And everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Again, it brings it back to God. 
God does the calling. God does the baptizing. It is it is the wonderful work that God does to us. Yeah, and again, the the question, what shall we do? Peter says, here's the way God is going to give what he has done to you in his gift of repentance, in his gift of baptism. It's for you, for your children, for everyone. The Lord's calling you to himself. And and apparently then, as, as Luke continues his narrative of this day, Peter just kept talking. He had many other things to say, summarized, save yourselves from this crooked yeah. generation. Yeah, with that, you know, I think the better translation is be saved um, mm. yourselves or be saved from this crooked generation. Because when, you, especially as English speakers, when we hear that save yourselves, right. it, 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 again, it comes back to this mentality of, oh, I, got, I have to do this in order to receive salvation, even if it's just, you know, God 99.9% and me just 0.1%. Um, but here, you know, if we translate it as be saved mm. um, yeah. from this crooked generation, then we understand that it is God um, who does the saving. Um, because, in, I mean, we would state, too, that we're a part of this crooked generation, mm-hmm. that we need, we need Christ to save us, we need Christ to forgive us, we need, we need the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And we, we would be fools to think that we could be the ones that save ourselves and, and reach up to God, right? As Peter makes those, those distinctions, there's this, the, the religion of grace and the religion of works, where the religion of grace, God comes down to us and saves us. The religion of works thinks, like the Tower of Babel, that we can make a name for ourselves and reach up to God. Right, and and that is not what Peter is preaching. And I like that that translation, "be saved." I think that is a, a truer translation to what Peter actually preaches here, and certainly gets the theology straight that that Peter is preaching. This is the Lord saving you from this crooked generation, making you His own, bringing you into His Lord in His into His Son's kingdom of light. And Luke tells us the result. There were about. 3,000 added that day. Those are the ones who were baptized and received the word. Give us the just the conclusion of the day of Pentecost there, Pastor Schuler. So thanks be to God, 3,000 people. Wow, that uh, I don't think I've ever been in a crowd of 3,000 people. But that's that's almost as God big that... as the town of Smithville. Smithville's got about 4,000. <laughs> so I think San Jose's bigger than that. We are, yeah. We're, I think, a million, a little bit over a million, I believe. But Anyways, my church does not have 3,000 people in it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so those who received his word were baptized. Now, again, I think that this can be, can be misused. They would say, you see, you have to receive it first um, and then be baptized. Um, but we must realize, and this is a point I forgot to, to bring up. You know, I, this is my first time doing this, so I'm nervous. And so I'm not even looking at my notes. I'm just going off of what I You're great. You're doing great. In my head. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Uh, you know, it brings it, one thing I forgot to mention is it brings it brings us back to the means of grace. Mm-hmm. So for those who received his word, were baptized. So what would allow us um, to receive the word is, is the Holy Spirit. So no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So when, when Peter is preaching this, um, and he says, repent and be baptized, um, the Holy Spirit is, is working um, in their heart. And so because the Spirit has been working, they're allowed to receive um, this. And then also, um, we, you see, the beauty of Lutheranism is we don't try to quantify right, the Spirit. So the Spirit can be given through the proclamation of the world, Word. The Spirit can be given um, in baptism. And so they receive this Word, and they're baptized. And thanks be to God, 3,000 people are added that day. Mm. Yeah, thanks be to God. And and that is again the the spirit's work. And and we should, you know, for those of us who who've not seen that many people all at once or seen that many people baptize all at once, we should also receive comfort knowing that wherever the spirit is present doing his work, even if it is just that one sinner who is brought to repentance, all of heaven is rejoicing, and we as the church can rejoice as well, even in you know the small town of Smithville, the, our smaller congregation. Whenever a sinner repents and is baptized and is brought to faith, we get the fullness of the joy that was there on Pentecost. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's, that's a great point. So, yeah, because we, we, we want to view it in the way of the gospel, right? 3,000, praise the Lord. One, praise the Lord. We don't want to view it in the way of the law where it's like 3,000, Oh, that's great. One, try a little bit harder. You need a little bit more. 
Yeah, no, and that and that's certainly anytime the the numbers are given, it's not for the purpose of, of as you said, working with the way of the law, trying to play the comparison game, but rather for the fullness of joy that comes when the Lord's word is proclaimed. And that's what's happened on the day of Pentecost. And that's what happens as Luke continues to give an account of the church and the way the word of the Lord continues to grow. So we pick up the text again. We're in Acts 2, verse 42 now. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's the rest of our text. That's Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. Pastor Schuler, I think Acts 2.42 is a very well-known verse as to what the early church was all about. And it's, it is amazing how rich this text is. There's four things mentioned. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. These are what the early Christians were devoted to. What, what are these things? Why are these so central to the life of the church? So, and again, to, to realize that when it says they, it's speaking about the people. Um, that were just baptized, that were just added, that just heard uh, Peter's sermon, right? It's a continuation. It's not, it's not another na- they or another group of people. So they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. And I think the first question that we should ask is, what are the apostles' teachings? Mm. And we could take it back to Matthew 28, the continuation of, of the Great Commission, um, where it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you to the end of the age, uh, and we must realize that when Jesus says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, that that would include um, the entire counsel of God, not, not just the, the law, but that the gospel um, would be included there. And, and this is kind of my, uh, I don't know if anybody's said this before, I'm sure they have, because I'm not that smart, but um, the apostles' teaching would be the same teachings that we have um, today. Mm. So, for example, especially us as Lutherans, right, the six chief parts, would have been the apostles' teaching. So they would have taught the Ten Commandments. Um, though the Apostles' Creed had not been written yet, um, the teachings of the Apostles' Creed are still found in the Bible. Um, they would have had the Lord's Prayer because Jesus taught that to them. They obviously are baptizing here. Um, they would have had confession, absolution, and they would have been celebrating um, the Lord's Supper, right? the breaking of the bread. So the apostles' teachings are the same teachings um, that we have today um, in our church, uh, and we give we give thanks to God for that. Yeah, I, w- I would recall the promise that Jesus made to his apostles in the in the Gospels, where he says, "You know, whoever hears you hears me, and whoever receives you receives me, and and the one who sent me." So that when we, you know, well, what is this the apostles' teaching? Well, that is the teaching of Jesus. He gave it to the apostles so that they would speak it and that we would learn it and that we would continue to hand it down. And that I mean, what a joy to have the Lord's word handed down to us so that we know that when we listen to, you know, the scriptures, this is the apostles teaching written down. We're not just reading the words of men. We're, we're getting the word of Jesus. And that, I mean, I think that promise of Jesus to his apostles is key as we think about what this apostles teaching was in Acts 2 and what it is for us today. What about the, the fellowship? Sure. Yeah. So the fellowship, I mean, we simply would state that, I mean, again, uh, I'm Lutheran, right? And you're Lutheran. That's right. <laughs> but when I when I would state fellowship, when I would state fellowship, um, we have fellowship today, do we not? Um, now, I wouldn't state that there is this grand difference in the way that we word fellowship here and the way that fellowship is used today. So when we are in fellowship with other um, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, I would not be afraid to state that um, there is fellowship within the preaching. There's fellowship um, within the altar, that we have all these things in common, um, mm. that we are in, in koinonia. Uh, and and it's, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I would say that, it, that as a pastor, um, in leading the flock that God has entrusted to me as an under-shepherd, my goal, in a sense, is to get back to um, verse 42, the apostles teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and, and prayers. And when things come and, and hinder that, you know, 
going back to the text and saying, this, this is what God desires for us, because this is, I mean, as Pentecost starts this time, um, that this is what the church, the early church was doing. And so we, we are that same church. Mm. So, yeah, the fellowship holding things in common, first the apostles' teaching, and, and later we're going to see that actually that, that applies to the way they use their possessions. The breaking of bread and the prayers, this, I mean, you know, that sounds like there's an organized worship going on. Is that is that part of what we're seeing at least? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We would state that the, the early church, right, they, they have their liturgy, and, and our liturgy is, is very is pretty much modeled, modeled after, and, and some things are you know, very ancient within our liturgy. But yes, they they have this. There is God is a God of order, right? He is not a, a God of chaos. And so we have the the breaking of bread, um, which we would state is is communion. You know, I, I wouldn't be afraid to hesitate. I believe the confessions um, talk about if if one were to, I don't have it in front of me, but if one were to state that um, that this is the Lord's Supper is not an incorrect understanding. Mm. But we also can't forget about the what is it the agape meal, mm-hmm. um, which the Christians would have been doing um, at the beginning. We have evidence of this in in First Corinthians eleven, and I believe it's what Jude twelve, and, and the prayers. And I think when we look at that, we should not just think of prayers as individual prayers, you know, mm-hmm. prayers that we pray in our house by ourselves and with our family. But we should also be thinking corporately, yeah. right? So as you're stating, this is this is what the church. Um, was doing. And later on in verse 46, it says day by day, they're attending the temple. This is what they're doing. They're devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Now it says awe came upon every soul because wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. We're going to hear some of those coming up. I suppose what's already happened at the beginning of Acts chapter 2 is a part of that. The, although, you know, that's more of what the Holy Spirit does right then and there. We're going to see more of that in the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 3 going to be a very vivid example with Peter and John. And and then in verse 44, everybody's getting together. I think that's an important point when it comes to the church, that believers are gathering together. And the way they use their possessions reflects the, the spiritual reality that they have this koinonia, these things in common in the Lord Jesus, and the way they make use of their possessions also begins to reflect that as they share things and they sell and they give to those who are in need. It, it maybe sounds a little foreign to us, but I think when you stop and think about what the Lord is doing here, it, it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And, you know, I think this might offend some people. I mean, it, it offends me. Um, but yeah. o- only in America do we have houses for our possessions. Hmm. And the, the Lord teaches us that our possessions um, are not our own. Um, but that we, we, we love one another, we, we care for one another. So the possessions that God has granted to us are, are to, to love and care um, for one another and, and for the church that, that he, has, he has blessed us with. So if we, if we have this understanding of that, it, it's, it's, it's still a continuation, right? God gives. Um, God gives you um, what you have, and God gives you the ability to understand that what you have um, is, is to love your neighbor um, as yourself. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this, this text, I think, strikes us as, as odd in our context. But if it, if it does, or if it, if it even offends us, maybe I mean, we need to ask ourselves why. What, what's so offensive about recognizing that I've got a brother in Christ who is in need? I have something that he needs. What, what is offensive about me giving that to him? Where, where does that bother us? And if it does, we need to, to examine our hearts and repent of wherever it is that, that we love our things more than we love our brother. You know, I, I think, you know, we, maybe it's because in our context, we tend to think politically about these things. And, and I've, I've had people, well-meaning people ask me, why, why are they communist or why are they socialist? And that's just looking at this text in the wrong, with the wrong lens. If we look at it in that political sense, I think we're always going to go the wrong direction. But just take it to that basic, you know, like look at your brother in need. What's offensive about giving him something? I, I don't, I just, I don't, when I look at it like that, boy, that, that cuts me to the heart to, to go back to the, the beginning of our text. Yeah, and I know we're running out of time here, but uh, one quick thing to mention on that is I think it does the text a disservice when we simply focus on 
um, the possessions being the things that we have in common. Yeah. That, that I would say, especially later on in Acts, that it's not just possessions, but it's you know what we believe, you know what we say, and, and what we do. These these all were things that they had in common in, in the early church um, because they they knew the gospel truth. Yeah, and I appreciate the way you said it earlier when it when that with that word fellowship. When we think about and the Greek word is the same, the same root about fellowship and then having all things in common. Right, when we have the Lord and his gifts together, then I mean we have all things together and it it naturally is going to show. And we want to be careful so that we don't make this text we've talked about this before. This is a descriptive text. It's describing what has happened, and it's not prescribing that this is necessarily exactly the way it's going to look in every time and every place. But but you know, having said that, we also want to make sure that we understand what is behind it. And I think the way you said it is very right, that it starts with having the Lord and his gifts in common. And if that's the case, then how, how do I look at my brother who's in need, who, with whom I've shared the Lord's body and blood and the Lord's word? How can I not share all of my things with him, knowing that it's all come from my Father in heaven? Anyways, yeah, I mean, it's a, there's definitely room for reflection, repentance in this part of the text. So you're, you're right, though. We are running short on time, and I do want to make sure that we, we get to the, the rest of the text. Uh, particularly, I, I think, verse 47. And, and feel free to, to catch anything that I've skipped. But I just love the way verse 47 ends, that the Lord added to their number. I mean, we've been making this point all along, and here Luke says it explicitly. All of this that's happening, this is the Lord doing his work, bringing people together into his church. Yes, absolutely. And I just want to real quick go go to 46, where it says, day by day they were attending telling the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, and they were receiving their food with glad and generous hearts. That we just, uh, I mean, I know this recording is, is, is happening in, at Easter Monday today, um, live Easter Monday, and we just finished having Holy Week, right? It's that's a time where we see day by day where we are in the temple, um, thanking God for what He has done for us, and and it's not burdensome, right? It's it's a joy. We we get to do it. Uh, we get to go there, and, and we praise God, and you know, right? God esteems that it is God serving us, um, serving us His gifts, and we have favor um, with all people. That the outside world, you know, sees us and says, "Oh wow, look at how they love one another." And within us, you know, we we love one another, we care for one another because of Christ caring for us. Iron sharpens iron, just as one man sharpens another. And the Lord um, adds to their number day by day um, those who are being saved. And, and I would say that the Lord still does that today, right? There there are still those um, who are being saved day by day. We might not see it, um, but the Lord is is still at work, and, and he, still, he still saves. Pastor Shuler, we have about two minutes left. As you reflect on this end of Acts chapter 2, help us to wrap things up this morning. Again, show us the, the good news that is here from this text. Absolutely. So when we hear that we are the ones that, that have crucified Christ, you know, we, we should be cut to the heart. Uh, yet in the end, um, we know that, that God is merciful, um, that God um, sent Christ to forgive us, and that with the Holy Spirit in our hearts, uh, we are able to repent, that we remember that we are God's baptized children, that we have been forgiven of our sins, um, that we have received his Holy Spirit, that this promise is is not just for us as adults, but this promise is also for our children. Um, this promise is also for those who are, who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God will call to himself, and that it is him who saves us from ourselves because we are a part of the crooked generation and that God adds numbers to his church when, when people are being baptized and we can rejoice in that. And we continue to this day devoting ourselves um, to the apostles' teachings, um, to the koine, koinea, um, to the breaking of bread and, and to the prayers. And we gather in the Lord's temple in, in his house, in his church, uh, and we give him thanks and praise for what he continues to do for us. And, and, and that's the beauty of, of church, right? We, we come to church because, first and foremost, God is serving us. And because he is serving us, we give him thanks and praise because he is continuing to, to call people and draw people near to him. And we give him thanks that he continues to remind us um, that he has not left us nor forsaken us. 
Pastor Isaac Struler is pastor at First Emmanuel Lutheran Church in San Jose, California, helping us today with Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. Pastor Struler, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Acts chapter 2, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.